אוקיי. כן. מה יש? מצגת? יש מצגת. אה, פה כאילו? יש מצגת, אין את המצגת הזאת, כי לא רציתי, כאילו... אני לא רציתי לתת לכם את המסקנות, כאילו, של ה... כאילו של המאמר, אבל אני אעלה אותה, היא כאילו שם, אני רק צריך להעלות אותה אחרי. איזה מספר? לא יודע. יש קצת. סליחה. היי. אוקיי, אז זו קלאס, אנחנו נדבר על הקנדל ארטיקל שאני נתן לך לקרוא, ואחר כך נתן לך לקרוא את הקנדל על ג'י פרוטין. קנדל? To the brainy days? Yeah. It's supposed to be in June. I think it's in June and it's planned to be in the new... Uh, so, hopefully... Yeah, if they build it, he will come. So, uh, okay, so... Yeah, so uh, a few words about Eric Kandel uh, before that is that he is really one of the forefathers of, uh, uh, of neuroscience. And... Uh, He started uh, working on uh, aplesia, um, like the sea uh, slug or sea snail, and uh, later on moved on to, uh, to mammals. But uh, he really, if you follow his work, also you can see in this article that he's really, he, he went through a specific, uh, uh, studying a specific molecular process and really followed all the steps of that process. And you can see it also uh, in these articles that are <coughs> uh, really well-designed experiments and very specific experiments that are, uh, that are built each one uh, to like, fit a big picture or a piece of a puzzle uh, that is, for example, in this case, uh, activation of uh, <coughs> G-protein or activation of, uh, of uh, LLTP that And as a result for that, it triggers long-term memory, okay? Um, so, first, the guiding question that, uh, that I put for you uh, for the article, that uh, a lot of time I put, these, uh, uh, I put these on because I find that it's difficult because sometimes we read something and we ignore uh, words like uh, what is uh, CRE uh, in general, which is not described in the article, uh, uh, I think, strictly. and describe what, what exactly is, uh, uh, what is CRE. And uh, <coughs> you can just uh, read through it and not, uh, not pay attention to that, and, and sometimes it really affects the understanding of, uh, of the article and these, uh, and these concepts. So we'll start first, first with what is CRE. Uh, what is CRE, not CRE. Yeah. So, It's a, it's a sequence of DNA, first of all, that is located in a promoter region of genes that we know that this protein, which is CREB, which is a uh, cyclic AMP responsive element binding protein, uh, associates to. So, in a sense, you can think about it as a recognition element or a sequence of DNA that this protein uh, knows how to recognize, uh, knows how to bind to, Uh, and, knows, and knows how to recognize. So, <coughs> uh, what is LTP, we can say, like, in general? Can someone give, like, a very, in a few, a few words? Yeah, so in general, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's regarded as uh, the strengthening of a synapse. Either it can have, like, a, a increased synaptic release, uh, increased... Uh, uh <coughs> increased amount of receptors, uh, but, or in increased growth of the synapse itself. But all of these, uh, uh, all of these phenomena together are re regarded as a long-term uh, potentiation, uh, <coughs> which, is, uh, which is measured normally by the difference between the activation or the, or the response to stimulation before the induction of this LTP and after the induction of the LTP. Okay, so the difference between these two Uh, between 
the potentiation before and after uh, is this phenomenon. And what is LLTP and ELTP here in the article? It's early and late. So it's early long-term uh, potentiation and late long-term potentiation, which is a, a distinction that Kandel made uh, specifically in this article, uh, which is important for the phenomena that we're going to see in a second. And <coughs> the, the genetic manipulation that they did in the article is on the uh, RAB subunit uh, of the PKA, or the protein kinase A uh, <coughs> protein. So in what way is the mutated uh, subunit different from that of the wild type? Or what is the effect? Yeah. So first of all, you, uh, it's mutated. And when you see that something in mu it's mutated, it means that the sequence is altered. Okay, or the identity of the amino acid is altered. Uh, in, in a way that uh, they describe later as dominant negative. Uh, which means that it has an inhibitory effect uh, on the, uh, on the, on the uh, YTAP protein or the, or the endogenous protein. And because of this effect, it actually, the, the sum of these effects are actually reducing the activity of PKA uh, in the cells or in the organisms that this RAB is expressed in. Okay? So this is the effect of the, the manipulation. And <coughs> uh, we'll address a little bit, I think, these uh, uh, later on in the article. So first, the research question uh, that, uh, that the authors came to answer here is, first of all, what is the relationship between memory and LTP, or LLTP? Because nowadays we think about LTP like, uh, like it's the same thing as memory, okay, today. But this was not the case 20 years ago. 20 years ago, one of the articles that based this concept and this notion is this article, in which, because when you think about it, it's just an electrophysiological uh, physiological phenomenon, LTP, okay, and LLTP also. So it doesn't necessarily have to relate to memory. But today, and also in, in the experiments that they showed the, uh, along the article, they showed that there is a link. They couldn't say what is the link. Today we know. Uh, more of the components that, uh, uh, that bind these two together, we're not going to discuss them today, but uh, there's a lot of research that, that, ha that has been done in the last 20 years about these subjects. And also to define specifically the role of uh, PKA for the concept of long-term memory. Again, to couple a molecular component with something that is behavioral. Okay? So uh, these are, thing, uh, are the two main uh, questions or objectives in this paper. And the way they did it is that uh, if, if, I try to, if I try to put like, the logic of the article in a, in a flow chart, is that first you need to, in order to prove that something is significant, then you reduce the activity of that, of the PKA. And they did that only in the hippocampus. Well, like, almost only in the hippocampus. Today we have better ways to do it much more specifically. Then they saw that this phenomenon, which is LLTP, is decreased in CA1, which is an area of the hippocampus, and <coughs> that animal exhibited, exhibited normal short-term memory, but deficient long-term memory. And finally, that the time course is parallel, uh, the time course that this phenomenon uh, was shown, parallel to what wild-type animals that are treated with protein synthesis inhibitor uh, show. So this is like the general outline, and now we're going to jump into the details uh, to see how exactly uh, they showed each one of these uh, different components. So first of all, their model. Okay. So they used mice, first of all, and uh, and what they did to this mice is that they generated transgenic line, uh, uh, lines of these mice, which uh, in these mice they had this construct which was inserted to their genome. And <coughs> apart from the, uh, so we we'll just go over like, and in the end, they just selected two of the lines that they generated. The thing that they don't tell you in the article is that they probably had dozens or many uh, transgenic mice that they generated. And two of these lines 
uh, were selected. They were named RAB1 and RAB2. And uh, <coughs> they were selected because of the expression uh, that they saw of this construct in, uh, in the areas that they were interested, specifically in the hippocampus, which is the formation that you see here. Okay, but also, you can see that they also had the expression in the cortex, but most importantly for them, they didn't see high expression in other areas of the brain. Okay, so they had, a, they had expression in the cortex, they had massive expression in the hippocampus, uh, but there was a very low expression in other areas of the brain, and if you compare it to wild type, you can see that there is actually expression, because in wild type you don't see uh, anything, uh, anything uh, but still it's considered, uh, or for them, it was considered low. So, <coughs> let's go over a little bit about this, uh, like this construct and why, uh, what is the purpose of it. Uh, so, the idea behind this construct, is th the aim is to express uh, the protein or the negative dominant uh, form uh, of this uh, RB subunit, and this is the area uh, that codes for this subunit. So, why do you need all the areas that are surrounding this? Why not just put this inside the DNA? Why do they need this? Yeah, the unit promoter, but why can't K2A? Uh, yeah, and, and uh, you don't know whether the effects uh, that expressing something throughout the body can be, can be massive. You can have embryonic lethality, you can have a lot of off-target effects that you're not interested. And if you're specifically interested in a single compartment, then it's best to just affect that single compartment. <coughs> and to do that, they piggyback ride road on a, on a gene that is known to express, to have this expression pattern uh, throughout the brain, uh, which is CAMK2A, and they just stole its promoter, and in this case, because it's 20 years ago, and they didn't know exactly what are the components, uh, what are the promoter elements, do you remember what, what's the length of this? It's eight, yeah, it's eight kilobase of DNA. That's a lot, okay? So the reason that they did it is because they didn't know back then which are the molecular elements or which are the sequences that are important for the promoter of the CAMK2A. So they just put a huge chunk of DNA behind, the, uh, behind their construct and they said the promoter must be there. Okay? Now that we know that most promoters are not, uh, the distance is not more than 2,000 base pair normally upstream uh, of the gene or the transcription start site, which is marked uh, with this uh, arrow. Uh, they also added an intron here. Why did they do that? And again, I repeat that an intron, for, for people that don't know, if we look, uh, again, we have this scheme of a gene, then these are uh, areas that will, not, that will be cleaved out uh, during the processing of the mRNA and will not appear uh, in the mature uh, mRNA and be translated to uh, uh, eventually to protein. So this is a piece that looks like it doesn't have any significance. So why, why should they put this here? But why? Huh? Well, to, today we know that there, there are other elements that people put to, uh, to increase uh, uh, stability of the construct, but uh, one, of the, one of the concepts that they knew back then, and we also know uh, now, is that a lot of time for the cell, if something under, undergoes processing, then it means that it will go into a pathway or it will have a fate that will be more uh, or closely related to the proteins that are normally uh, that nor normally in the cell, thus it will be kept or maybe more stable and the mRNA will be processed uh, 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 accordingly and the mRNA, uh, the mature mRNA will be more stable. Uh, and <coughs> well, I don't know if it's not true, uh, I don't know if it's not true entirely, but today there are other elements that people add to constructs in order to stabilize them. Okay, and uh, so another, the, the last element that we didn't uh, 
uh, that, we, that was added to this contract was this, which is that poly A. What does it mean? So normally, all the mRNAs in the <coughs> uh, all the mRNAs in the eukaryotic cell are what we call polyadenylated, meaning that they have a poly A tail that is added to them uh, for stability and also <coughs> to prevent from degradation. So here I, they added a polyadenylation signal, which will cause uh, which will cause the cell polyadenylate uh, to polyadenylate this transcript. So. You can see that apart from the center component that you need to, uh, to get your protein translated and the effect, <coughs> you, you have to have a lot of uh, regulating elements surrounding it in order to make it uh, expressed specifically and also to have it stable enough in order, to it to, in order for the mRNA to make it to the actual uh, uh, protein level. Okay? So what they do is not that it's completely artificial, but it doesn't mean that like it's generated with artificial methods, but it doesn't mean that the sequence itself is like chemically made. Okay, meaning that m most of the time the constructs that are this large, uh, they're like, they just cut it out of, a, of a, out of a genome, then amplified it, and used that sequence in order to uh, attach it to this, and attach it to this, and attach it to that. It's not that... It's a, it's a DNA that was donated, like in a sense. They, they just took these elements out of, uh, geno uh, out of genomic regions that they knew uh, other mice or uh, genetic components that they knew uh, that they, uh, were there before. Uh, it's done normally by PCR or uh, in some cases like mass amplification is done in bacteria. Yeah. You add them. Like uh, if you. Uh, I think I think they're artificial. I think they're. Artificial. I actually don't know where uh, nucleotides how if they're uh, harvested from somewhere or made. I think they're made. Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's ar it's ar it's artificial, but the sequence itself is not like it's not like it's built like uh, artificially, one by one. Uh, like that you, nowadays you can like type a sequence, you, can, you have companies that they can synthesize like whatever sequence that you want, okay? You can uh, uh, type whatever sequence of letters that you want and they will give you and they will chemically produce that for you, okay? In this case, it's more like the, the information is not artificial, but the production is artificial, okay? So. Um, cDNA stands for, uh, it's, a, it's more like a, yeah, it's like complement DNA, but it's complement DNA because it's complement of the mRNA. Uh, it's, it stands for the fact that it's, uh, it's taking, cDNA is taking from the mature, uh, from the mature part of the protein. It's not taking from the original genomic uh, context. So for example, if you want to, if, the, if this is a protein that you want to, uh, uh, if you want to translate, you don't have to put it with all the introns because it's huge. I told you that these introns can, can have uh, tens, of, uh, tens of thousands of base pairs long. Okay, so you don't want to introduce all these. You just take like the spliced or the processed form, and this is considered cDNA. Yeah, it's a reverse mRNA that is uh, in the form of DNA. But later in the cell, it turns back into mRNA. Okay, and yeah. They added the inference because of the notion that we have that if something goes through processing, through natural cellular processing, then it will be stabilized later on. Okay, and if something doesn't go through, uh, through processing, it will be, in a sense, considered to be more artificial by the cell, and thus can be uh, degraded and less stable. Okay. Uh, it's just from experience, like they know uh, from past experience from a lot of like uh, people who uh, are uh, that study molecular biology like uh, myself we know like certain elements we know certain regulatory elements which are important uh, for stabilization so we just take these elements from other uh, experiments that that you had and you just 
put them in this context. Okay, it's for previous knowledge. Okay, uh, and again, what is important to notice here is that uh, the method that they used is uh, against the mRNA. Okay, uh, they they put a probe, uh, uh, a fluorescent, or I think in this case it's a radioactive even uh, uh, probe against. Uh, the mRNA in order to detect it uh, and this is not on the protein level so this is the, in the level of the RNA this expression so <coughs> the next experiment that they did is now that they have these mice they want to check what is the phenotype of these mice so the, the first thing that they wanted to affect is the pKa so obviously you need to measure the activity of the pKa and we talked about that pKa is, a, uh, is protein kinase A which kinaz stands for a protein that phosphorylates or that transfers phosphate group normally from ATP uh, to proteins. So the assay that they used in order to do that, uh, again, is radioactive. Today we use more fluorescent assays uh, because people don't like radioactive anymore, which makes sense. And uh, <coughs> uh, what, they simp what they do is that they, uh, they have this chip that has a uh, like a substrate or a small peptide that has a binding site for the or a phosphorylation site that this kinase knows how to phosphorylate then they incubate it uh, with a sample or with a, a extract or protein extract that they take from the uh, from the tissue that they're interested in and after a, a certain amount of time they can measure how much phosphorylation like or how much of the phosphate in this case uh, they use the ATP that in the third position had a radioactive phosphate and this phosphate is transferred by the kinase to the peptide and, the, and by the amount of uh, radioactive uh, emission uh, that they see in each one of these wells during time they know the activity uh, of the enzyme. And normally activities of enzymes are measured in picomoles per minute per milligram uh, of tissue. <coughs> so. Uh, it's, a post, it's like some, I don't know, we, we don't define it as a post mortem, like uh, when you extract RNA or protein or something. We don't. Ah, you don't need, uh, you don't need a time frame to capture because you add the substrate in a specific time. You add, the, you add the ATP, like this sample doesn't have any ATP in it. I don't know if you remember, but we talked about the fact that ATP is very, very uh, unstable molecule. Like in conditions that are not in the cell, it degrades very fast to ADP. So what they do here is that they just take the sample with the substrate and they add the fluorescent ATP. Okay. Like in the in the moment that they add the fluorescent ATP, they start the measurements from that. Okay. It's already it's it's there. Okay, so there is a there is a basal level. There's always like almost anything in the cell, almost every everything in in the cell is not like all or none. Okay, so we always have a like a basal activity, which is actually what you see here, uh, of the uh, of this protein or of this kinase. And what you can see is that if you look at the uh, at the wild type, then relative to the wild type, they can see that the activity uh, of the enzyme is lowered in both of the lines that they generated. But like you claimed uh, justly, uh, what we saw in the example in, in previous class very shortly is that this PK is part of the pathway uh, that is activated, for example, by cyclic KMP. Okay, so which is the <coughs> which is one of the uh, which is the secondary messenger in the G protein G protein receptor pathway. So in this case, they added cyclic KMP, and you can see that the basal level went from here to here. Okay, but even in the basal level, there is a significant reduction in the activity uh, <coughs> of uh, this enzyme. And what do you think about this reduction in activity? <laughs> yeah, so we have all the different opinions here. It's significant, so it's significant. Like, there, there's a huge discussion about significant, statistic significance and actual significance which is a lot of time not the same thing. Um, but in the end, the significance is, is uh, due to the phenotype that they see in the end. Then we know that even this reduction has probably an effect 
okay? But it's actually, uh, in the experimenter point of view, you, you will not want to have like maybe a too drastic effect because then probably it will affect other cellular processes and stuff like that. So in a sense, the fact that they only see this, I don't know, 20% reduction <coughs> in the activity and, and later on see this dramatic uh, phenotypic effects uh, are like encouraging or show like that even this subtle a change can have dramatic effect on the phenotype, uh, not, but not on all phenotypes. Yeah. It means, uh, of course, there is always normal PK that is being produced, but the, the dominant negative form of the RAB uh, is like inhibiting it uh, in general. But it's always uh, obviously you have both. You have both of these factors together in the cell. Yes, and if you have more no dominant negative form, then you have more inhibition of the PKS. And this is actually what they see, because in, the, in a sense, in the R, it's not significantly different, but trend-wise, the fact that they have, ah, what I didn't mention is that in this mouse, they had 16 copies of this insert, and in this mouse, they had seven copies of this insert. And <coughs> you can see it a little bit maybe in the trend, although it's not significant, that in the second line, they have a, a, a greater reduction or a, or a greater effect uh, of the uh, domain negative form of the, uh, uh, of the R unit of the PK. Okay? So, <coughs> what is exactly... They check, no, they check the ability to, of PK to phosphorylate because this substrate is, is, a, is a substrate that PKA knows how to phosphorylate, okay? And uh, the way that they, that, that the idea is that if you have more kinas, then this will be increased. Like the, the PKA activity, <coughs> this is actually, this actually represents like, it doesn't mean like uh, if you have, the, the, the nice thing about this essay is not that, it doesn't measure the amount of the protein, it just measures the ability of the protein to do its job. Here? No. In, the, in this essay that they, at least uh, according to what they described in the method, they used uh, a special form of uh, radioactive ATP, which has a gamma, which we, the, this is like the alpha, beta, and gamma phosphate of the ATP. And the gamma phosphate ATP uh, is uh, what we call 32 phosphate, or is a radioactive isotope of phosphate. And <coughs> What the kinase actually does is just transfers this phosphate to the substrate. Okay. So and then you wash the uh, you you look at the, apparently what they did here, like in order to measure it, is probably you have to wash away uh, like the sample and uh, uh, just the things that are bound. Like so the the free uh, radioactive ATP <coughs> the free radioactive ATP uh, is washed away and the kinase is washed away and everything is washed away and what you measure in the end after the washing is the amount of phosphate that is now bound to this well in the chip. So the amount of phosphate represents the amount of phosphorylation uh, and that's the activity at the end. Okay? So <coughs> what exactly did they, uh, uh, did they look at and where did they get this uh, idea from? Is that from a past experiment, what they saw is that if you uh, so again, this is the experimental uh, uh, design or experimental uh, model of what, they, of what they did, is that they isolated in a slice uh, mouse hippocampus. And then <coughs> what they do is that they uh, activate the, what, what is called the Schaffer collateral, which is a group of, uh, uh, of axons that are going from CA3 to CA1. And then they record it from CA1. Actually, they didn't record it with a, like a pipette that is here it looks like it's doing like a patch clamp on the cell. It's not a patch clamp, it's actually like a more uh, field recording, uh, like a more uh, uh, broad area recording uh, of the response of, of this stimulation uh, on these uh, cells over here. And it's actually like a model of these synapses that are created between CA3 and CA1. So if they give 
one, what they call tetanus pulse, which is uh, just a burst, uh, a train of pulses that uh, <coughs> come in short intervals between them. Uh, then what they see is that, the <coughs> that now if they stimulate, just give a, a, a single stimuli, then the response is elevated after this tetanus pulse. Okay, like the, the EPSP, acidic to potential after uh, the potentiation is now higher than what it was before. Okay, so this is classic LTP. You give it, you, you measure it before, you, you like give a pulse, measure the response. Give a pulse, measure the response. Then you give a tetanus pulse, and then you do the same thing, and you see that the responses after the tetanus pulse are higher. So this is potentiation. And <coughs> but this potentiation decays uh, in the order of magnitude that like uh, it doesn't it doesn't look like this here in this uh, chart because they actually didn't take it from the article but uh, it decays uh, it decays much faster than if you give four tetanus pulse trains. Okay. So first of all, what they wanted to check uh, check is uh, like control and they saw that uh, and again I divided it into the term long-term potentiation, so this is the long-term of it, and this is the potentiation, like the amount uh, of potentiation relative to a baseline, uh, which is normally like 100 or 1. Uh, the, the, the response of what they tested before, the F here is again because it's field, it's not like specifically from one uh, neuron, it's more a, a field potential. And <coughs> the first thing that they saw is that there's no difference in what they call early LTP uh, between uh, between WASAP and the and the experiment mice. Okay, so you see that uh, in all these cases you have uh, you have a nice potentiation and then a decay after 60 minutes if you give one pulse, and if you give two trains of tetanus pulse then you have a decay that is more or less like 90 minutes. But there is a difference if you give if you give four tetanus pulses, and when you think about it, it's pretty it's pretty strange, you know, the the fact that there is such a precise precise number that triggers a totally different response. Okay, so if you give four trains of tetanus pulses, then what you see is actually uh, a large effect even in the early phases. Okay, even in the early phases of the response you see a difference between the wild type animals and the, uh, and the transgenic mice, which indicates for the researchers that there's something fundamentally different in the process that is happening uh, in this case of four trans tetanus pulses. Yeah, I see that you're troubled. Yeah. It's probably... Yeah, probably it's not, and also it depends on the frequency, and also it depends on the amplitude of the pulse, and, and all of these things, but, uh, but still there is something, you can agree that there is something fundamentally different from the response that you saw here, even in the early phases, remember until 60 minutes, and relative to what you saw here, in the two trends of the total pulses, which could indicate, again, like the researchers say, it could indicate a different pathway, something that is different molecularly that is happening in these uh, uh, <coughs> in these slices, and uh, and again they show here the the effect of the potential, the effect of the stimulation of a single stimulation. Uh, this is like before, and this is after 180 minutes. Okay, so this is before, and this is, so this is here, and this response is something uh, over here. So for the wild type. The, this potentiation lasts for a very, very long time, and for the uh, transgenic animals, you see that this potentiation uh, does not last. And after 180 hours, there is al almost no difference between the response before and after 180 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't say that the activation that the they don't say that the mechanism through the the function of it, of the PKA happens only after 60 minutes. Okay, 
the activation of PKA or the involvement of PKA can happen in a few or tens of milliseconds or seconds. Yeah, you can see that there is uh, a difference between the two groups. Yeah. Why? But why is it not related to PK? Because they're, they're, this is the only thing that is different between these, these animals. Because PK is not activated in this short time. Of course it is. No, I said, I said, that, the activa I said that the activation of PKA is something that is very rapid. Like it happens in the order of magnitude of uh, a couple of hundred milliseconds or a couple of tens of milliseconds or seconds. Right, but but still, in order to activate it, the thing is, what they claim here is that L, a long-term LTP is not happening. It's still happening in short time scales, but the fate of the process is remaining for a long time. Okay, it's not that long-term LTP is happening over a long uh, long period of time. It's still like uh, it's still very. Again, when you think about these four titanic pulses, they're happening in very in a very short time scale. So. What, what they try to say is that a very, uh, like a massive input that is transmitted through this Schaffer collateral during a short period of time triggers a response which is different from a normal input. So they say that, that in early LTP it doesn't involve like the, it doesn't involve PKA so much. Because it's like it's like but but if it's not if it's short term if it's like ELTP then it's not through PKA okay you, you can imagine it as two rows okay and the cell can either go in the in the process of long term potentia uh, like LLTP or ELTP okay and what happens if if it uh, if uh, the system receives two pulses, it goes in the in the direction of the ELTP, and that doesn't involve PKA and has other mechanisms, probably like MK2A, calcium, whatever. Wait, and then if it gets four pulses, then it goes in the other direction. This this crossroad, like, and this this decision is happening in the instance of the of the tetanus pulses. Okay, so you cross a threshold of activation that makes the system decide that it's now going to the direction of LLTP that involves PK. And there there is a deficiency. Yeah. And doesn't it seem sure it's just like a threshold? Maybe it's just like a continuous uh, making of the, of the protein and then in certain points you start going more to this side or to that side, but it's always producing the protein. It's different. Yeah. It's actually, it's from the start different, right. It's not that the, again, it's not that the effect, yeah, we can, of course there is no such thing as a threshold. Like uh, in, in, uh, in molecular biology, there is something that looks more like a threshold, but it's not like something binary completely. You have, it's a, it's a process, but still I can think you do have distinct cellular pathways that a cell can take. And this is the point here, okay, that it goes to a distinct cellular pathway. And <coughs> early what? LTP has an early phase. Yeah, yeah. So what? Well, again, not all the uh, explanations that they they say about what is known about LTP and all these functions are described in this article. A lot of them, they refer it to the references. But in general, it's not that they, like, uh, that this concept is not completely, is not completely new. It's uh, something that Scandell worked on for, uh, for a long time. I don't know, like, exactly in this article, they don't make this, uh, they say that there's an early component and a late component, but they don't describe exactly how they knew it. But, uh, but again, I think if we focus on the main things here is that this is like the general, general idea of distinct pathways. So one of the nicest things about this article is that they went again, uh, and I, I like to say it each time I present this article, is that probably this is the first experiment they, di that they did on these mice. 
Okay, after they saw that they were healthy and okay, like I told you, they probably had like 12 transgenic mice that they did. One of, probably one of the first things that they did is, is put them in a Morris water maze. Okay, and just after that, they did all the electrophysiology tests. Because this is much easier. But they show it in the, like, the reverse way because it makes more sense logically to say we first did a molecular model and then we tested it behaviorally. But what probably happened is that they saw a behavioral phenotype and then they, uh, and then they went to look which is the molecular aspects that uh, this correlates with. So <coughs> I gave it to read. I'm not going to go over Morris Waterman because I gave you it, it in the introductory to this article. So uh, what they actually saw is that uh, in the target quadrant, uh, they spent much less time in the target quadrant than the wild type mice, which means that they have a memory deficiency, which is associated to the hippocampus. And <coughs> also contextual memory, which is related to, uh, to hippocampal function, uh, they saw that there is an effect 24 hours uh, after the context or the, uh, or the learning. Which didn't, which is effect did not show one hour after learning, meaning that there is a long-term effect here that is affecting our mice or their mice uh, in contextual memory. Why did they put this test here for? You know, what is the conditional? So CS is conditional stimulus, so it's a conditional, uh, conditional freezing uh, test, right? So the distinction that they want to make here is, be is between hippocampus and amygdala. And like I showed you before, in the article they show that there's almost no expression of this transgene in the amygdala. So again, they wanted to show that their effect, and this is like the most, one of the things that's most hard, that's hardest to show in uh, biological work or scientific work in general, is that your effect is specific. Okay, that they're, because if we, we, if we would see like a general decline in memory in these mice, we could say, okay, they had a problem in development, problem in metabolic, problem in I don't know what. Okay, it's not, they have an effect, but it's not specific to anything that you're saying. So, in one of the things that, so the first example that they showed us is that short-term LTP is not affected, which is very important, also to show that the cell is functioning okay, and the synapse is okay, and everything is okay. And the second specification, is the brain region that they saw the effect. So this is hippocampus uh, uh, associated uh, function, and this is amygdala associated function. And in amygdala associated function, there is no effect. Okay, but there is no difference in the contextual, in the in the memory or the response to conditional stimulus in amygdala associated memory. <coughs> And the last piece uh, that they wanted to show and wanted to connect it to, uh, uh, to protein synthesis is that they put uh, anisomycin, I think. I don't remember the name. But some kind of antibiotic that blocks, <coughs> that blocks protein synthesis. And what they saw that if you administer the, protein uh, the blocker of the protein synthesis, then you get effects that are very similar to what they saw, just that now it also affects the memory in the amygdala. So this is wild type mice. All of these these two graphs are just wild type mice that are administered with this uh, protein inhibitor antibiotic. So <coughs> they actually showed that protein uh, synthesis is important for both types of long-term memory. Uh, but their effect was specific to the hippocampus and looks similar in the effect in the time uh, in, and in the time course to inhibition of protein synthesis. Okay, so. In the end of every great article, there is a model. Okay, then there, some of it was shown in this article, shown with, some of it was shown in previous articles, like about the fact of calcium and calmodulin and tyrosine kinase and whatever. All these parts <coughs> were different, but what they show uh, specifically in this model is that, they, that if you have a response, or they call it a modulatory input, e.g. dopamine, like they're saying here, then through G protein copper receptor activation, you can have the f uh, increase in cyclic AMP, then uh, association or activation of PKA that later uh, moves to the nucleus, phosphorylates uh, cyclic, AMP, uh, cyclic AMP responsive element binding protein or CREB, activates it, and then CREB can bind 
to the uh, recognition element and start translating or start uh, transcribing genes that are required for <coughs> for the change that is needed for the RTP. I, I have a question. The main, the RTP, yeah. this protein may can affect or these proteins are what make the RTP? Or they continue mm -hmm. with a bad way to so go to the synapse or, or how does it work? Well, well nowadays we know that CRE, that, that this uh, cyclic NP responsive element is present in a lot of Im what we call immediate early genes, like CFOS, BDNF, okay. uh, a lot of these uh, proteins that are transcripted factors by themselves, okay? Meaning that they, like CFOS uh, is starting to, uh, this is like what triggers the transcription of CFOS. When CFOS is produced, then it returns to the nucleus and starts, uh, and starts uh, transcribing a, lot of, a, set, a second set of, uh, uh, of genes that probably they are responsible for the, for the continuum of the LTP. Well, so it can either be they can either be. I'll give you an example. There is a one like famous uh, one famous uh, protein world space which is uh, called ALK, which is activity regulated cytoskeleton, for example which is it's termed like that because it's a cytoskeleton protein that uh, in response to activity, it makes the synapse like larger. Okay, so the synapse itself grows. And if the synapse grows, normally you have more receptors, you have more, <coughs> you have more ability to take neurotransmitter in, and the response is, uh, is, is stronger. So you have a lot of, we didn't talk about like what molecularly causes uh, LTP because there's a lot of processes. There is translocation of a, uh, <coughs> of receptors, new, new receptors, there's anchoring of receptors that are like, we, we talked about that they're floating around the membrane, uh, they're anchoring, there is potentiation of the receptors themselves. So this triggers like a cascade of things? Yes, so yes, definitely, okay. definitely. So there is one thing that uh, bothers me about this, uh, this model. What, can you, can you tell me what? No, this, this is okay. Okay, time scale maybe. Does does this look like an neuron to you? Okay, so. Well, they didn't know it back. Yeah, they didn't know it back then. Back then, there was a very straight coupling between like back then was an an era of before the RNA revolution, so it's where people thought that RNA is just a step on the way. Okay, so this is why the nucleus in your model has to be close to the synapse, because otherwise you can't explain it. You, you, have, you, have like a, you have to have like the proteins made here, then they have to move to the synapse. So how do the proteins, how can the proteins move to the synapse <coughs> if the synapse is one meter away or, or uh, 10 centimeters away? Okay, or in, the, in our hippocampus, it's like a few centimeters, even that, is, is a huge distance for the protein, for the new proteins that are made like here to be shipped uh, to that location. And also how does the signal get from the synapse back to the, to the nucleus, then we can understand that maybe, but how does the, how does the effect of the nucleus return to the specific synapse that was, uh, that was activated here? Okay, because the neuron has 10,000 synapses and not all of them have to be potentiated. Okay, so, these are things that we're going to discuss in the, the next chapter, not, not the chapter that we discussed today, but it's like problems that they ignore, okay? Because obviously this does not look like an error. Okay. I think this one also you clearly see that there are other transcription factors that are affecting CREF, so it's probably the PTA, like a bunch of transcription factors that are coming here. Yeah, w one thing is for sure here that, they, that this is a very simplified model. Even today, like even for what they knew back then, like there, it's not only, this is not the only pathway of LTP and not the only pathway of potentiation and all of these things, it's just one, okay? But apparently it's a significant one because otherwise it won't see an effect. That's super, and again, but 
what we said at the beginning, that it's not going down very late due to the virus, it's not that much. But Maybe still the effect on the LLTP is significant, yeah. and the yeah. memory. If the cyclic MP is located in the sign of itself? Sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. It's, it doesn't necessarily, like, the, in the sense of hormones, it's true that when we talked about also, uh, when we talked about, we started talking about signaling. In the case of hormones and what you call, like, neuromodulatory effect, it, like, like it's drawn here, it doesn't have to be in the sign. It doesn't have to be also in distant location. It can be close. Okay. Can ha you mean like if you can have a G-protein G couple uh, receptor activation like in the synapse? And then uh, how much do you need it for, it for it to go to the nucleus? Like how much... Sick uh, if the sticky can be, can, can travel from the synapse to the nucleus? Probably not. But... So again, in this case, they do not, they don't know that yet. Like uh, in this case, today we know, but but they do show, show one mechanism, which is COMK2 uh, A activation that we know that that they knew uh, even back then through NMDA, like the, the entrance of calcium. But this mechanism, you see that they, it's like something. They didn't even know. They don't even know the receptor that uh, that gets this. Okay. What, one of the things that they say here is that, that COMK2A is activating uh, this identity class and not the G protein, for example, and that, uh, and, and that this can trigger an elevation cyclic MP and, and uh, vice versa. But today we know that most of the cyclic MP activation is a lot of time because of G protein activation, not because of COMK2A activation. Um, again, because of the distances here and the, also what you say the chronologically and the how exactly is one component is supposed to get to this component in a way that will trigger a response that will make sense to later for the synapse to be uh, to be uh, activated or to be potentiated is unclear. Like in this in this stage. Yeah, but they also don't address that this problem. But. Okay, so I think that this is uh, like this is the main uh, this is the main uh, concept of this article. Again, uh, this is just one one piece of the puzzle. That later during uh, the later years, you can follow Candela's work and see uh, how how this progressed to really understanding like how uh, how LTP is forming. We we still today don't understand completely how exactly the molecular processes are translating to memory, but <coughs> but we have a better. Uh, but you have a better idea. Okay, so we'll take a break, I think, yeah? Yeah. We'll take a short break. Uh, let's say 10 minutes. And then, uh, because we have a lot to do on G-protein copper receptors.
רשתות חלב, כי יש, <אז> יש הרמונים כאילו שהם מאוד דומים להרמונים האנושיים וכל מיני דברים כאלה. אבל נגיד בסויה יש הרמונים הרבה יותר דומים. הם יותר דומים להרמונים האנושיים מאשר ההרמונים של הפרה. למשל, הם יותר דומים להרמונים האנשיים. זה אני באופן אישי, לא אוכל את זה.
thing to understand is from the, we did not, last week we talked about, we did an introduction to signaling molecules in general. It's important to understand that G protein is just one example of uh, signaling molecules and, uh, <coughs> and this whole uh, concept of signal transduction and uh, uh, that is happening in communication between cells and organs in the body. Um, we, last class, we did an, uh, we also did an interview or an overview uh, on G proteins themselves. We said that most of the time G proteins uh, are these trimeric proteins that have uh, alpha subunits, beta and gamma subunits. Where is that? <coughs> and alpha subunits, which is uh, which is the GTP L that it breaks down uh, GTP to GDP. And there is a gamma and beta uh, gamma and beta subunits that uh, are linked together. Uh, we described the basic mechanism of action of G proteins, uh, which is after you have an activation of a receptor by a hormone, uh, it triggers a conformation change that associates uh, the G protein to the receptor, uh, thus making it uh, available to bind uh, instead of the GDP GDP. A GDP causes a conformational change uh, that dissociates these two subunits. different uh, <coughs> a G-protein-coupled receptor. 
What? Yeah, it's the same because when you think about that there's only like 22,000 genes or something like that, then it's a, it's a huge amount. In humans, we have much less. We have about 300 uh, uh, genes. And obviously, the combination of the activation of different receptors in the other system uh, creates a sensation of smell or the perception of smell. And, uh, and this relates to what we said uh, before about the high specificity uh, of the receptors to a specific Okay, but apart from the fact that there is a lot of genes that encode for the receptors, there are not so many genes that encode for the G protein itself. Okay, so uh, a certain uh, G protein cover receptor can work uh, like or or a system uh, different different receptors can work with the same G protein. Okay, so in general we have 27 genes uh, that encode for the G alpha. 5 for the G beta and 13 for the G gamma subunit. Okay? So it looks like maybe a lot, but it's not a lot relative to the amount uh, or types of receptors. But the, but the effect of the, Gs, uh, of the different G proteins is can, uh, can be uh, inhibition or activation of their target uh, effector proteins. Okay? So. activated or only 
one response that is activated. You almost always have both of them. But obviously in different organs and different cells, you have different combinations of activation and, in, and inhibition. Okay, for example, the, the, the example that I gave before is that the, in, the heart, uh, in the heart cells, the beta adrenergic receptor is more prominent uh, than the alpha adrenergic uh, receptor. Okay? So in the end, this affects the level of cyclic MP that is inside the cell. So, and like we said before, almost all the effects of cyclic MP are mediated through the PKA, the protein kinase. And this is an enlargement of how this actually, it's not the actual, uh, how it actually looks like, but this is a model for, uh, for inactive PKA. So if PKA is inactive, so again we have this R subunit, that the catalytic, uh, the catalytic, catalytic subunit or the kinase subunit uh, is bound to, and in this phase the PKA is inactive. But once it's bound to cyclic AMP, then uh, there is a release of these units, uh, of these subunits, and <coughs> these subunits are now free to phosphorylate target protein. then the receptor can activate many uh, <coughs> G proteins. And, and one of the NAC class, because again, we're talking about a molecular switch, not a ratio of one to one between the G, G proteins and the amount of cyclic AMP, then once the, the NAC class is activated, it, it can produce many cyclic AMP molecules. And these cyclic AMP molecules uh, can then release uh, protein kinase A or uh, render protein kinase kinase A active, and this kinase can phosphorylate many enzymes or many proteins that in their turn can modify many products or produce many products. So here we can see that just uh, like in a very, uh, in a very like roughly speaking like it was here, then we have at least four levels of amplification of one epinephrine molecule. Okay, so you have a you have a system that allows you to, to generate huge signals in response to, uh, to a very low signal, okay? So it's not, it's not proportionate, that the, the response is not proportionate to the original signal that was, uh, uh, that was receptive. Okay, so how does this response end? Uh, on the short term, if we have, uh, we, uh, I separated it into two responses. The termination of the response can be uh, in response to the fact that, you, that the cell or the organ just saw uh, a limited amount of hormone, for example. Then what will happen is that the affinity of the receptor for the hormone will decrease uh, <coughs> uh, with time. And uh, cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase, which is the enzyme that you can imagine from its name, which is cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase, hydrolyzes the cyclic AMP into AMP, uh, and that's 
terminating the general response. That, that's what happens, for example, for a normal response. That this is how the response will, uh, uh, will be terminated, and the hormone will dissociate from the, uh, from the receptor, and that the general response will stop. Uh, this is an illustration of that. But for prolonged activation, uh, there's additional receptor specific enzyme that is called beta adrenergic receptor kinase, or BARK, that is activated what, what is, uh, okay. that is activated by PKA, actually it was supposed to be here PKA. So BARK desynthesizes that adrenergic receptor itself through phosphorylation. Okay, so and this is called homologous desensitization, like this whole process in which a response of a receptor ends up in desynthesizing the receptor itself. It's called homologous desensitization. So, did we learn that kinase is something that activates it, and that the different form is something that deactivates it? Well, yeah, the, the more exact term is like I told you a lot of time we give you the example that phosphorylation activates. But it doesn't necessarily have to, to activate. Uh, it, is a, it is a very important distinction between, like, because molecularly what happens is an addition of a phosphate. Like the activation is just like my interpretation, but a lot of times, uh, li like we're going to see right now, uh, it can it, it can cause a desensitization, uh, like in this uh, example. So what actually happens if you have prolonged activation is that. Because of this activation, you have activation of PKA, which you don't see here, but the PKA can phosphorylate this BARK, and this time it does activate the BARK, but the BARK by itself, is, which is another kinase, adds phosphate groups to the receptor. Okay? So it actually gives, uh, in a sense, a type of memory for the amount of activation uh, that was received. So for example, if you have a lot of phosphorylation on the receptor, that means that the uh, that the activation uh, proceeded for a long time. Okay, because this process uh, also takes time, the phosphorylation of that and the diffusion and phosphorylation uh, in the end of the receptor itself. But what actually, ignore this for a second, but you can imagine that if, th if this is the receptor, this is the type of exterior, then what our BRK does is adding phosphate groups to specific areas of the receptor. But what does this phosphorylation do? This phosphorylation can do two things. One, it can, uh, it can affect the ability of the G protein to now associate uh, uh, with the receptor. And in, uh, in cases where you have a lot of phosphorylation, then it recruits uh, a second type of protein, which is called beta arestine. Uh, which is a cytosolic protein, and this uh, this other thing can bind uh, to the phosphorylated site and cause, uh, in one of these examples, there's a lot of causes that can happen because of that, but one of them is, for example, endocytosis. Of the receptor. Of the receptor itself, with a membrane that is uh, encapsulating it inside the vessel. Like the beta-arcine The beta is, is a protein, a cytosolic protein, that knows how to bind related site or to the phosphate groups uh, of the receptor if, if it's phosphorylated. Okay? So you can imagine that if you have a prolonged response, then initially you're going to start having phosphate groups on the receptor itself. These phosphate groups would prevent or interfere with association of G proteins. So they, the amount, of the ability of the receptor to now activate G proteins will be diminished. And if this continues even more, and if you have a uh, massive activation, then the phosphorylation will get to a state where uh, the arestine will now recognize this protein and will cause endocytosis, meaning that encapsulation and uh, total removal of this receptor from the membrane. Okay? So it's two processes of, of desensitization of the receptor. One is like more transient and one is more, in a sense, permanent. Because it binds to the phosphorylation, and the phosphorylation is caused because of massive activation. It's like autophosphorylation, it's not autophosphorylation because it's not the receptor itself, but the activation of the receptor is what causes this phosphorylation. For example, if there's just one phosphate, then the better esteem will not bind, bind here. Okay? But one phosphate can interfere with interaction with the G 
G protein. But in this case, I'm just, for example, I'm giving you an example of endocytosis. Okay, so phosphorylation means beta alkene will bind? Yeah. Phosphorylation means that, that this is what beta, like before that, if there's no phosphorylation, then beta alkene cannot bind to this uh, A receptor. Okay? For example, it's, it's two phosphates, but in the example that we're going to see in a second, it's like three phosphates. But I will not take. Uh, maybe it's not even. Maybe not even this is true. Like the amount of the phosphate. Maybe there's not two phosphates. It's like five phosphates. But in the book, they don't uh, focus on that. And we we shouldn't like uh, on the exact amount of phosphates that it needs to for better or better. Leans into the more philosophical aspects of that. But this also happens in the endocrine system. Does this thing? Of course, yeah. This is this whole this whole like this whole example up until now was about the adrenergic system. Okay. But it happens also in other systems, like you're going to see in a minute. So we saw one example of G protein couple receptors that affected the AC class in the response to that. And <coughs> I will give you like two uh, two examples of G protein couple receptors um, that regulate ion channels. So one of them again is acetylcholine. And what can I do? The system is involved in a lot of the molecular processes, not me. But uh, we saw the example uh, two classes ago about the nicotinic receptor in the neuromuscular junction. This time, this is a different type of receptor. This is a muscarinic receptor. Uh, which does not directly open a channel uh, by association to acetylcholine. It, uh, <coughs> when acetylcholine is accepted by this uh, muscarinic receptor, again it undergoes transformation of change association with G alpha. But this time, after the G protein is uh, activated by itself by uh, substitution from GDP to GTP, the G beta gamma subunit is actually the one that does the work here. It diffuses along the membrane and binds. In this case, to a, uh, to a potassium channel, opens it, and in this case, it will cause hyperpolarization uh, of the target cell. So, for example, you can see these muscular, muscular receptors in a heart muscle cell, and this will cause, cause a slowdown in the heart rate. So, uh, the version by acetylcholine will cause a slowdown in the heart rate, uh, in this case, because it will lead to hyperpolarization. The G alpha is not the one that affects the effector protein, but the G beta gamma. So this is one of the uh, cases that this happens. Uh, another classical example of the of the ability, our ability is our ability to detect light, which is a lot because of the, uh, the activation of G protein. And uh <coughs> so, if this is a reduction cell or, or a rod. This is a rod cell, a human rod cell. Uh, and the structure of the cell that has the synaptic, uh, synaptic area where it transmits a neurotransmitter to in ganglia cells, the neurons that uh, are downstream here. And you have the nucleus, but most importantly, you have a compartment or the outer segment of this cell. Uh, this is an electron microscope uh, where it contains uh, a 
lot of layered uh, membrane disks. Okay? So you can imagine that this is like a membrane disk that is inside uh, that is inside this cell. And on these disks, you have uh, these molecules that are called or proteins, they are called uh, <coughs> opsins. Uh, and these are specific uh, these are specific proteins or G protein coupled uh, receptors that uh, are activated when they absorb light or photons. Okay. So specifically, the rod cells uh, are are very important to detect light in uh, low quantities, like uh, for night vision. Uh, in our, uh <coughs> uh, they're they're much normally uh, distributed in the periphery of our vision, but not in the central foveal uh, vision. Uh, and also because of that, because a lot of times because of that we don't have the uh, color vision at night because we uh, it's termed that we have rod vision. If someone says that you have rod vision, it means you have uh, more sensitive to light, or but black and white vision. Yeah. When you say that the protein is activated by the light, you mean it's changing its conformation? So we're gonna we're gonna show exactly how this happens. So if we zoom in inside one of these opsins, then this is like the molecular structure. Again, you can see this. Memory spanning alpha helixes that we have uh, known, to, uh, uh, known to love. And the molecules that we have, so this is the uh, rhodopsin molecule, the rhodopsin protein. And inside this protein, we have a molecule that's called uh, retinal. And what happens is uh, that this retinal is the actual conformational change that happens when it, uh, when it absorbs uh, light or absorbs a photon, is that it changes that this double bond between carbon 11 and carbon 12 is changed from cis conformation to trans conformation. Okay? And this is because of resonance, which is like resonating when he grabs the photon with I actually don't know what is the, what is the physics like behind this uh, absorption. Um, it's a good question. Uh, but for us, we know that if a photon is absorbed to this molecule, we have conformation of change. And this conformational change triggers a larger conformational change in the protein itself, thus rendering this uh, protein uh, now able to activate uh, a G protein that's called GT now, which is like G transduction. Uh, transduction. Uh, <coughs> but it's just a, a G protein for our case. Uh, and uh, in this case, this, this happens very fast, but uh, the absorption of the, uh, the photon happens very fast, but the conformational change uh, stays long enough in order for it to activate the G protein. Okay? So, yeah. No. So, it's a good question. What happens after the conformational change is that actually uh, this, this leaves or diffuses away from the, uh, from the channel itself, and then there's an enzyme that knows how to return uh, this retinal molecule back to a cis conformation. We are producing this rhodopsin or? Okay, so, no, the rhodopsin is a protein and we're producing it. But the opsin is the protein. Opsin and rhodopsin, rhodopsin is one example of an opsin. Opsin is a general name for a, for a protein that absorbs light. What? Yeah, this here. So, so rhodopsin is an example of an opsin. Okay. Okay. It's a family like opsin. A rhodopsin is an example of an opsin. Okay. But I don't see the the first type bond like this protein. I don't see the what. What the, the bond here the between the opsin? amino acids and this is like a molecule inside the amino acid, the protein, no? Yeah, this is a molecule that is that the fact that it's uh, depicted here that it's like separated is first of all because it also we know that it diffuses away and detaches from this uh, uh, from this molecule and also to emphasize. That that also this is like a molecule that is not part of the it's not part of the of the protein that is like synthesized from a gene. But it's not an amino acid. It's not an amino acid. Exactly. So we're like do we we produce this protein? This you molecule. You mean retina? Retina. Sorry. Ah, no, okay. Not protein. I was sorry. Sorry. The retina. Okay. So that's a that's a good question. Retina is actually uh, vitamin A. Ah. Okay. And uh, so we have to interpret. Uh, the body can produce it. Can also produce it. But it's like separate. It's not produced like it's independently oh, produced. Exactly. Uh, it's a metabolic thing. Uh, besides the protein, 
we also ingest it. You know where we have a lot of uh, uh, protein, uh, a lot of vitamin A in okay. carrots. Because uh, it's not that we have a lot of vitamin A in carrots. We have a lot of beta carotene. In beta carotene, uh, our body can take beta carotene and produce uh, vitamin A. <coughs> I think that he talks about, he, he, he meant, he talked, like, he was trying to ask about this molecule, but he said, yeah, what's, so rough, what's weird about this molecule? No, no, my, my question it. was uh, that, is how do, like, do we make that process? That's not what in the molecule that is inside the protein, or if we ingest it, or yeah, where does it come from? That was what, why this, like, out of everything we learned so far, why like, this thing bothers you? Like, why, what do you see here that is different? That okay. like Maybe we'll Maybe we'll discuss that later. Like, no, uh, this um, okay, we'll discuss it later. Just because, uh, but I think it was just a mistake. Like, uh, in terms, yeah, in terms. Um, so uh, from from this, obviously, comes the uh, comes the claim that you need to eat a lot of carrots in order to improve your vision. But actually, uh, we know that a lot of times this is not the case. I even found it like uh, one example of this uh, online on a <laughs> rabbit that has glasses. So you see that it's uh, every rule has an exception. And it's e even e eating a carrot while uh, wearing glasses. Yeah. Okay. I don't understand how the old dog can activate the uh, Okay, so we didn't get into really the molecular, like what happens after this conformational chain. But what you need to know is that after the conformational chain of the uh, of the retina, then this triggers the conformational change in the protein itself. And the conformational change in the protein itself, like we saw before, enables now this receptor to activate the G protein. Okay? So uh, I think it will be like, so after we have, so this is like, a, again, a molecular model of the odopsin together with the G protein. So, <coughs> and this is like the locations where the G protein is anchored to the membrane. but after the activation of the G protein, then the, uh, after the activation of the receptor, then the G protein can associate with this receptor. And <coughs> after this association, we can have the whole mechanism of switching of the, uh, uh, of the GTP to GTP, the dissociation of the GL from the beta gamma, and the cascade of events that happens afterwards. Okay? So what actually happens is that inside these uh, Rod cells, if we are in dark conditions, then the resting potential of the cell is minus 30, which is different from uh, what we learned uh, uh, so far, which is normally like minus uh, 70 in, in most of the cells. <coughs> and this minus 30 is due to open cyclic now GMP, okay? So in the system, uh, until now we were talking about the secondary messenger of the system was cyclic AMP. Now we're talking about a different type of secondary messenger, which is cyclic GMP. So this, uh, this channel, or this sodium or uh, this sodium calcium channel uh, is activated when it's, uh, uh, when it's bound or when, uh, when it's associated with cyclic GMP. <coughs> and during dark conditions, this is what happens in the cell. You have constant flow of sodium and calcium positive ions inside the cell, which are causing a depolarization of <coughs> uh, of the rod cell. What happens, uh, what happens during light? So when light is absorbed by the opsin, again, the opsin undergoes a conformational change. This conformational change causes called association of the G protein, a substitution of GDP by a GTP uh, molecule, the breaking of these two subunits, and here, again, the G alpha is the one that does the work. And what it does here is that it, it releases inhibition of a unit called gamma subunit uh, from, uh, from this protein which is called PDE. And what this protein does, or what this enzyme does, is that it knows how to, how to break cyclic GMP uh, into GMP. Okay? So the effect of all this uh, activation of the absorption of light in the end is lowering the, uh, lowering the level of cyclic GMP in the cell. And if we are lowering the level of cyclic GMP in the cell, then we will have less cyclic GMP to open this channel.
channel, the channel will, will close and will uh, and will have uh, a hyperpolarization of our cell. Okay, so the cell is actually the raw cell is unique in the sense that it's actually releasing neurotransmitter all the time in the dark, and once it absorbs light, it stops releasing neurotransmitter. Okay, so it's like activated all the time, but once it, once it's absorbed light, it becomes inactive. So, <coughs> again, because this uh, cascade has a huge, uh, uh, huge level of amplification that's not depicted here because here we're showing you everything in one-in-one -one proportion, but like I showed you before, which is not, uh, which is a hallmark of G-protein copper receptors, they have a high degree of amplification. So this is actually the, me the mechanism that enables us to detect theoretically a single photon of light, because a single photon can create a cascade of events that will actually uh, alter the activity of the whole cell. Okay? And this is very important uh, to vision when you're just walking in the jungle and a, a tiger is about to... These cell towns are beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Are highly specific to different processes or because they seem very similar to the in different... You mean these? Yes. They are the, the ones who make the work. So they, yeah. they are specific for one pathway or that there's not huge diversity. There's only 27 yeah, like uh, genes, but I think that the context is, is what's most important, like where they're exactly in the cell and if and what are the affected proteins that are there to be affected by. Okay, so okay. one alpha cell or beta cell unit could affect more than one process, more than one yeah. segment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, so this is what happens uh, in light, and this is again, the, this crazy amplification is what able, enables us to see a single photon. But as we know, our vision, which is pretty amazing, uh, is able to detect light over nine orders of magnitude, meaning that uh, the relative luminescence of, of moonlight is 0 0.01 black units, and uh, full sun is 10,000 units. Okay? So on one hand, we, we have the ability to detect, to detect a single photon, but on the other hand, we know that all of us uh, see perfectly well uh, in full sunlight. And this phenomenon is a lot uh, due to the raw cell's uh, adaptation to varying levels of, uh, of light. Okay? So they do it through two main processes that I'm going to discuss. One is receptor phosphorylation, similar to, to what we saw uh, before. And the second one is serotranslocation or movement of the G proteins and our skins themselves inside the cell. So <coughs> in, res in receptor phosphorylation, uh, this adaptation is, is, uh, is done with an enzyme that is analogous to what we learned before about the beta adrenergic receptor kinase. And each oxygen molecule has, in this case, has three principal serine phosphorylation sites, meaning that it has three, three possible locations for phosphorylation by this enzyme. And the more sites that we have phosphorylated, that the oxygen that is activated is less able to bind GL protein, uh, uh, to activate. Okay, and that its effect is uh, damping. So <coughs> the extent of the, of the oxygen phosphorylation is proportional to the light. So, for example, if we are in dark condition, then the the oxygen is not phosphorylated at all, and when it when it detects small amounts of light, it is able to fully uh, harvest its potential to activate uh, G protein. And, uh, and that activation of GLP. But <coughs> what happens, uh, and under like uh, medium conditions, you can have some degree of phosphorylation of that oxygen. So uh, this illustration of like these arrows indicate the, the amount of activity that the oxygen can have, or the potential activity that the oxygen uh, can induce. Uh, once you move to high light condition, then the oxygen is fully phosphorylated. And this reduces dramatically the ability uh, of this oxygen uh, to activate G proteins. And in the end, it, it, uh, this whole process is uh, completely terminated, or there is no activation at all uh, of G alpha when we have the, the binding of the arsine molecule. Okay. And in this case, uh, the arsine, I think, it doesn't cause uh, endocytosis. I think. In this case, the arsine just blocks the 
uh, the ability of the option to uh, uh, to be decentralized. But uh, but again, no, it would also make sense with what you're doing. If you make a prosthesis, you have layers of uh, oxygen in the membrane, so it will yeah. It will have less light. So yeah, it yeah. kind of makes sense. I just I just I'm just not sure like in this, that in this in this example, I don't think that there's going to be mm. uh, in this case. But but nevertheless, there still has the ability to completely block the ability. proteins in the cell uh, in dark conditions. And when there is light conditions, it's exactly the opposite. Okay. So in light conditions, you have, have a lot of arsine molecules, making them, uh, the concentration, the relative concentration of them in this region is high. So it means that they will bind much faster and much stronger uh, to the oxygen in order to, uh, to dampen the response to light. And you can see almost the opposite thing for the G protein itself. So uh, in dark conditions, you have a high concentration of the G protein um, <coughs> where they're supposed to be to, uh, to be activated. And in light conditions, they're more or less distributed homogeneously throughout the cell. Okay. And this movement of the RSD to the OS is caused by phosphorylation? No, it's not caused by, it's independent of the phosphorylation. These two processes are independent of each other. I told you I'll give you. Like there's two examples. One is receptor phosphorylation, and the other is cellular translocation of G proteins in our skin. Okay. So these are two. Know why this happens? Why the goes? So actually, we don't. Like we don't. We don't. It's easy to imagine why. Like it makes sense because okay. if you have, but but, but we don't know. We don't know the molecular process until now that causes this translocation. Okay. So it's a good question. It probably is cleaved from the from the membrane of the membrane anchor and just uh, is uh, shipped to a different location. Well, maybe the whole the whole membrane is going down, but you have like right all. No, I don't think that the whole membrane is going down. It seems like a relatively long process, uh, and um, yeah. so that's why it's taken very quickly. Yeah, it happens in ten minutes. So it takes ten minutes of exposure to to have this. about cone vision at all. Okay, so we have a different type, different set of photoreceptors that uh, are sensitive to, uh, uh, to color and also to high, uh, high quantities of light. So
fast enough or the estimation is fast enough uh, to the fact that you just move to uh, you mean like the time when you're uh, when you're blinded <laughs> by, by bright lights to the time when you're yeah, okay yeah but that's also it's a good it's a good point yeah I think that a lot of it is because of the pupils like probably the pupils and then this molecular process is happening and also, and and also maybe you're starting with the phosphorylation that's like a fast action yeah. and then you keep like the long term I don't know. But, but again for sure for sure you're right that that this process is not is not happening during the time that you're flashed with uh, with light phosphorylation can happen in order of uh, like tens of milliseconds or seconds easily but uh, so it can account for that but the translocation is something it's a more uh, uh, prolonged process and probably more relative more relevant to the like if you're exposed for long periods of Probably what? No, so it doesn't mean that they're not. Well, they're they're not yet that no, but you still no, have. No, you, you still have them, but they can't activate because they're, there's phosphorylation. But the sensitivity of the system in dark, it just means uh, that the sensitivity of the system in dark is very high because all the three proteins are, uh, are clustered together or are concentrated together in the place where they can be most active. We just have to we just have to part uh, the last small chapter, so we're we're gonna talk about that uh, in next class tomorrow. And uh, I think I will also post like the questions. Ah, we didn't go over the questions for the la latest chapter, but so we'll go over both of them uh, next time. Okay.
the area, the layering of the tissue, the mm. this is what actually what you see here. Uh, so, so, so you mean the tactile is uh, axle or something? No, it's, it's still a part of the cell. It's a part of the cell. <laughs> you see it's this area. Uh, but in each one of these, like, <coughs> you have the OPL region of all the cells is here. Okay. And you just need to imagine that there's a lot of cells sitting and spanning this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? So, you have, uh, each one of the cells has an OS region, IS region, a nucleus, and an OPL region. So each cell has uh, this region? Yeah. Okay. Each cell has this distribution. Okay. So, they don't show you here in the single cell level. Uh -huh. This is more in the tissue level. Oh, so but because the tissue is organized, like okay. all the cells create this organization, okay. then you can say that this is like the arestine is located in the location of uh, the OS of all the cells. Oh, so you mean still uh, they align like Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just imagine that there's a lot of cells like this. That was what I was trying to show you like here, that there's like the level of the nucleuses, and then there's the level of the dendrites here, and the uh, levels of the so, 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 so for example, in, in dark condition, so the, the G protein, so in this cell, so they maybe move this region. Yeah. In dark so, condition. So, it, so it's also inside the one cell, I mean. It's everything is inside the cell. Everything, okay, okay. okay. All the movement is inside the single cell. Okay. But when you talk about circulation, then you see it as a layer. Oh, okay, okay. Okay? Okay. So, so we have a, a class tomorrow afternoon, right? Yeah. Tomorrow. At four. Okay. Four to six. Yeah. Four to six. Thank you. 